Hello again. At the end of the last lesson, we were looking at a two-class data set where the accuracy on one of the classes was very high and the accuracy on the other class was not very high. But because there was an overwhelming majority of the instances were in the first class, then the overall accuracy looked very high. In this lesson, we're going to take a closer look at this kind of situation and can come up with a more subtle way of evaluating classifiers under these circumstances. Here in Weka, I've opened the weather data, 14 instances, a simple artificial data set, and I'm going to classify it with naive bays. I've selected naive bays here, and uh, there it is. I'm interested in the confusion matrix. In fact, I've put it over on the slide here. Here is a confusion matrix. And you can see there's A's and B's, yeses and no's. There are seven A's that are classified as A's, and two A's that are classified as B's, incorrect. There's one B that's classified as B, that's correct, and four B's that are classified as A's, incorrect. I want to introduce some terminology here. We're going to talk about true positives, those seven correctly classified A's, and true negatives, that one correctly classified B. And then false positives are negative instances that are incorrectly assigned to the positive class. They look like they're positives, but they're false. That's the four. And false negatives, uh, conversely. And we're going to be interested in the true positive rate, that is the accuracy on class A, which is 7, the number of true positives, divided by the total size of class A, that is 9. And the false positive rate, which is the number of false positives, 4, divided by the total number of negative instances, that is 5. And uh, that's point A, that's 1 minus the accuracy on class B. Now, the main uh, point of this lesson is that there's a trade-off between these things. You can trade off the accuracy on class A against the accuracy on class B. You can get better accuracy on class A at the expense of accuracy on class B, and vice versa. And to show you what I mean, let's go back to Weka. And uh, I'm going to, um, on the More Options menu, I'm going to output the predictions. So let's just run Naive Base again. And I'm interested in this table of predictions. These are the 14 instances. And for this instance, which is actually a no, Naive Bayes had a prediction probability of 92% for the yes class and 0.074 for the no class. These two things add up to 1. And because the probability for the yes class was greater than the probability for the no class, then Naive Bayes predicted a yes incorrectly as it turns out, because it would actually a no. That's why there's a plus in this error column. So that's the way Naive Bayes gets all of its predictions. It takes the yes probability and the no probability, and it sees which is larger and predicts a yes or a no accordingly. Over on the slide, I've got the same data, and then I've processed it on the right into a simpler table with just the actual class and the probability of the yes class that's output by Naive Bayes. And I've sorted the instances into decreasing order of prediction probability. So at the top, we've got an instance which is actually a no, that Naive Bayes predicts to be a yes, because it's the prediction probability for a yes is 0.926, which is way larger than the prediction probability for a no, one minus that. In fact, if you think about it, it's like Naive Bayes is drawing a line uh, at the 0.5 point here, that horizontal line. And everything above that line, it's predicting to be a yes. Everything below that line, it's predicting to be a no. So the uh, true positives are uh, those yeses above the line. Uh, that's uh, seven of them. And uh, below the line, the yeses below the line are incorrectly predicted. Uh, positive instances. So the true positive rate is 7 over 9. And conversely for the no class, things below the line are predicted as a no, so there's only one correct prediction there below the line, that's the very last entry. 
uh, and there are four no's above the line that are incorrectly predicted to be yeses because they're above the line. So that gives a false positive rate of 0.8. Now, like I say, there's a trade-off. We could change things if we put the line in a different place. Naive Bayes puts it at uh, 0.5. But if we were to move the line from 0.5, that's the P line, to 0.75, that's the Q line, then we'd have a true positive rate of 5 over 9. That's those five yeses above the line compared with the four yeses below the line. And a false positive rate of 0.2, that's the Q point, the Q line. And we're going to plot these points on a graph. So we're going to plot the accuracy on class A TP against 1 minus accuracy on class B, FP, and you can see the P and Q points on the graph. Now we can get other uh, points on the graph by putting the line at different places. In the extreme, we could put the line right at the very top above the first instance, and that means that we'd be classifying everything as a no, which gives us 100% accuracy on the no class. That's an FP rate of zero and uh, a zero accuracy on the uh, yes class, that's a TP rate of zero. So that's the zero, zero point on the graph. And then as we go down, if, if we take our uh, horizontal line and move it down the table one by one, we're going to be kind of moving up along that red line until we get to the top, the upper right-hand corner, which corresponds to a line underneath the whole table where we classify everything as a yes getting 100% accuracy on the yes class, and uh, nothing as a no, getting zero accuracy on the, on the no class, the B class. So you can get different trade-offs between accuracy on class A and accuracy on class B by putting the line at different points. That's for a single machine learning method. What about a different machine learning method? Well, different machine learning methods will give you different red lines. So uh, there's one, the dashed line down a little bit below. That's actually uh, worse than the naive Bayes line with the P and the Q on it because where you want to be is in the top left-hand corner. The top left-hand corner corresponds to perfect accuracy on class A and perfect accuracy on class B. That's where you'd like to be. So lines that push up towards that top corner, that uh, sort of top red dotted line, are better. That's where you want to be. And one way of evaluating the overall merit of a particular classifier, say the one, the naive Bayes one, joining the PQ line, is to look at the area under the curve. That's the uh, area shown there. If that area is large, then we're going to get a better classifier evaluated across all of the different possible trade-offs, the different thresholds. So the area under the curve is a way of measuring classifier accuracy, independent of the particular trade-off that you happen to choose. So actually in Weka, you can look at this curve. Uh, it's called a threshold curve, and we're going to visualize a threshold curve for the positive class. And uh, that's what we get. It's not a smooth curve, it's a bit of a jagged curve. In fact, just we're plotting the y-axis against the x-axis, true positive rate against false positive rate. And uh, each of these points corresponds to a particular point in the table, a false positive rate against true positive rate. There's 13 points, plus one at the beginning and one at the end, 15 points altogether. So the point that I've circled there, that corresponds to a false positive rate of two-fifths and a true positive rate of five-ninths. And uh, all of the other points correspond to different points on the curve. And what we want to measure is the area under the curve. It's called a ROC, Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve, for historical reasons. And Weka prints out the area under the ROC curve. In this case, it's 0 0.5778. And if we could find a classifier that pushed a bit more up towards the top left, then that would be better give us a better area. And actually, if we were to evaluate uh, J48, which I won't do, but it's very simple, same data set, just run J48, look at the curve, you'll get a curve like this, the dashed blue line, 
which is better, the area under that curve is 0.63, better than naive bays. Okay, so we're looking at uh, threshold curves that plot the accuracy of one class against the accuracy on the other class, and that sort of depict the trade-off between these two things. RFC curves plot the uh, true positive rate against the false positive rate. And they go from the lower left to the upper right, and good ones stretch up towards the top left corner. In fact, a diagonal line corresponds to a random decision, so you shouldn't go below the diagonal line. The area under the curve is a measure of the overall quality of a classifier, and it turns out that it's equal to the probability that the classifier ranks a randomly chosen positive test instance above a randomly chosen negative one. This has been a bit of a theoretical lesson, and uh, it might be worth going to the textbook and reading the subsection on ROC curves in section 5.2. The activity associated with this lesson involves looking at actual ROC curves in an actual classification system. So, good luck with that. And I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.